Uh, this is Bill Schultz, historical writer at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I have with me today Dr. Gerald Dorff, class of 1964, residency 1970, and I'll bet there's a fellowship year in there. Actually, I started my residency in 1967 through 69. I had two years of internal medicine. Okay. And then I uh, was able to start, in those days, you, after two years, you could start a fellowship. And Mike Reitel just started with the medical college uh, that fall. And uh, we interviewed, and I decided I really wanted to be his fellow. I had looked around various other areas in the country and uh, lamented the fact that there was nobody of stature here at uh, the medical college. Well, Mike Reitel was the answer to my prayers. Uh, so I started uh, my fellowship in infectious disease uh, in 1969 through uh, almost all of 1970. So it was 1970s when you finished your fellowship. Correct. Finished your residency in 69. And what I'll do is I'll correct our, our records, okay. which we're doing all the time anyways. All right. No, that's great. You know, I, I wanted to jump back a bit and, and ask you, tell me a little bit about your background. Where are you from? I'm from Milwaukee. Um, my, my father uh, was always a blue collar worker. And uh, one day he came home from work when I was just a little kid and he said, I want everybody to empty their piggy banks. I'm going to lease a tavern and we're gonna need to have some money to put some liquor behind the bar. <laughs> So that tavern was on 24th and Center Street, and uh, he was there for about three, four years. And then uh, his lease was up, and uh, he went back to work for the Milwaukee Sentinel as a pressman. And then he got another lease for another tavern on Six and Keefe. And from there, uh, eventually bought a place on uh, Port Road and Febrance. So he was in the tavern business for 27 years. In the meantime, I was going to school. I went to Marquette High School and uh, lived above the tavern wherever it was at that time. And my job was cleaning the tavern in the morning. And believe me, <laughs> if you can do that, you can do anything in life uh, particularly the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in any event, uh, I gradually uh, got into medical school, met my wife. We got married before I started medical school. Her father, who was a doctor, met with me and said uh, to his daughter, he'll never make it. He'll never make it into medical school. Well, that's all I had to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you got me laughing through this whole thing, Jerry. And then it, well, it, it was rather humorous in retrospect, but at the time, uh, there were a few words spoken. <laughs> and uh, we, we went into, let's say my wife and I, went into medical school in 1960, and uh, we had our first child in 1961 and we ended up with seven children so uh, and now we have 25 grandchildren wow. and four great-grandchildren and, and how many of those seven children came between 1961 and 1970 uh, probably five okay so you were very busy along with school Yes. That would make for a, I, I can hardly imagine having four or five kids and going through medical school as well as residency and fellowship. I, I literally can't imagine it. I always had side jobs. They'd call it moonlighting. In fact, um, I forget who it was. It was one of the uh, deans called me the king of moonlighters. And I didn't know whether that was a, a slight at me 
or or whether he was he was actually giving me a compliment. As it turned out later, uh, I talked to him about it, and he said it was a compliment yeah. because I was willing to go the extra mile, and I did, and I did finish uh, medical school with uh, very little debt compared to today's standards. Right. Well, you know the uh, the one one uh, theme through. Uh, Many of the interviews that I've done so far are the number of guys that did do part-time jobs during medical school. I don't think that's as big a uh, factor anymore. I don't think too many of our students are out there working, uh, cleaning, you know, bars in the morning and uh, moonlighting at other jobs. We had to do it. Uh, the other interesting job I had was working at um, a foundry as the uh, nurse on call. I <laughs> They gave me a cot to sleep in, and anybody got a cut or whatever, or any major problem in the foundry, uh, they asked me to give first aid or send them on to the hospital. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You got to do that while you're in medical school. It paid pretty good. Oh, that's great. The, you know, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, your, you, did you have any physicians in your family that uh, influenced you to go to medical school? or? What was the impetus for you to decide, I want to be a doctor? My dad told me that I was going to be a doctor when I was 10 years old. Wow. And I don't know how he told me that. But the reason I know that's true is that I started delivering papers when I was 12 years old for the Milwaukee Sentinel. And they would have a little blurb in the paper uh, once a week, that your carrier for the week is and my blurb said that I'm going to be a doctor. Wow, and I was at, at 12. 10 years, at 12. Yeah. That's a great prediction. Came true. <laughs> That's great. You know, at, uh, I was gonna ask you, at Marquette High School, did you go to Marquette University undergrad? Yes, I did. Were you uh, of the years that you could jump into medical school after three years? Or did you get your degree and they, then? They stopped it the year before I got my degree, so I, I got my BS degree uh, in uh, at Marquette University, and uh, and then I went into Marquette Medical School. So I'm one of the the few 3M doctors. I know I, that's Marquette that, High, Marquette U, Marquette University uh, Medical School. That's great. I'm going to stop this for just one second, only because I want to ask. Okay, now. Jerry, let's continue uh, here related to Marquette. And you were a 3Mer, which, uh, you know, actually you'd be surprised. There are more 3Mers than you'd think. But you know what? All of them that I've met are extremely proud of the high school, Marquette University, and the medical school. In our class, which was a little over 100, we had uh, somewhere between 12 and 16 I've heard various numbers in that area that went on to medical school. They didn't all come to Marquette, mm -hmm. but uh, I think there were 16 that's, that became MDs. That's a large number from one, any one university when you've only got 100 in the class, when you're looking right. at 16 to 20 percent. No, that's great. While at Marquette, obviously there, uh, you know, everyone has great stories about uh, their, their college days or medical school days. Or any of the professors that you had that jump out at, at, at you that you've got some interesting stories that you might want to share? Well, one of the professors that I identified with uh, very closely was uh, Professor Griesbach. He used to teach philosophy. And uh, he had seven children. He had ended up he ended up with eight children. The eighth one was a boy. The first seven were girls. <laughs> so we got to know one another pretty well. Um, and then uh, there was uh, several priests that were fantastic. Uh, Father Cook was a great teacher in uh, theology. I found out later on he had left the uh, Jesuits, but he was tremendous. And then uh, uh, I had very good teachers in in chemistry. So 
I found that my background at Market High really prepared me very well for pre-med. Um, and then once at medical school, you had the Walter Zeitz, the Armand Quicks, and Hiram Benjamins, and, and others. Oh, yes. And they were just tremendous. Uh, very likable and uh, good teachers. Uh, Benjamin liked to uh, scare the heck out of you the first day in anatomy in one way or another. Uh, uh, and uh, I remember he would always pick on, he had his pet people that he picked on. Uh, <laughs> but fortunately, I, I kept my nose clean and uh, I, I turned out to be one of his favorites. So. And what did, what did Dr. Benjamin teach again? Was that, uh, I know Zeit An, taught anatomy. Well, uh, Benjamin taught gross anatomy. Okay. Um, and, and Zeit was more microscopic okay. anatomy. And uh, um, Benjamin, one of the favorite stories was his uh, ca categorization of the female anatomy, uh, particularly their breast. And he had pictures to show. Uh, the, there were the pointers, the droopers, and the super droopers oh, were the ones from Africa oh. that would carry their babies on their back and they could breastfeed them at the same time. You didn't have too many women in your, uh, your class, did you? No, we had four. Four. And they all shrunk below the, oh. down in their desk at the time he'd give that lecture. But... Uh, did, it, out of the four women, uh, uh, were any of them nuns? Yes, yes. Uh, we had uh, Sister Schneider, um, and there was Hannah, but she was not a nun. I, I didn't have that much contact with yeah. with the women. Yeah, it's, it is interesting that in those, even through the late late uh, '60s, it was uh, always you know just four or five. Yeah. It wasn't until the mid mid later seventies that the numbers really really began to grow. And I don't know why. I don't think that was really by design mm -hmm. that the medical school didn't accept them. I think it was more of a um, uh, situation in society that women doctors were few and far between. Well, it gives uh, a lot of credence to their uh, stick to itiveness that they. They went to medical school, and many of them did awfully, awfully well. Yes. I think, and, and I think the nuns, many of them that before and even a little bit after were Mary Knoll nuns. I think doc, uh, Dr. Hirschbeck's sister might have been a Mary Knoll nun. I think he had a connection. But, uh, you know, while you were at um, uh, Marquette, that was just a few years. When you graduated in, in 64, that was just three years before Marquette severed its ties to the medical school due to financial problems. Did you, during the time you were in medical school, did you know that there were some challenges going on or had that not really surfaced? Well, it was all over the newspaper, the, uh, uh, the fact that the medical school was in trouble financially and uh, the state would not agree to give them any money because there were a number of activists who uh, wanted to make sure there was separation of uh, church and state, which is nowhere in the Constitution. But uh, then, so to correct that, they severed their ties with uh, the Jesuits and changed their name. Right, 1967 yeah. was the, the change. and. Uh, and, and I changed three years later. I received a lot of ribbing about that for a number of years. I, I you know, I heard about it through many of my years while I, I was uh, working uh, full time at the college. But uh, all has turned out well as we just broke ground on a brand new seven story office building this morning. Uh, so I hear. It, it's going to be great. It's going to this campus is, is really something. Um, you know, having worked with you on reunions, uh, you've been close to your classmates over the years. Your class was a very good class, close yeah. to each other. Uh, any stories uh, about any of your classmates that you can share? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the funniest ones occurred actually during my residency. Um, I had, was fortunate enough to have 
a very good intern on my service. And as it turned out through a scheduling quirk, he ended up being on my service for close to six months. Mm -hmm. Usually a rotation was six weeks. And uh, it turned out that uh, we were both uh, avid fishermen. And uh, whenever we could work it for someone to cover us at Milwaukee County General Hospital, we would sneak off in the afternoon. I had a boat, a uh, rowboat, and we would launch it into one of the lakes, many lakes around here. And one afternoon, we were out fishing primarily for uh, panfish. And lo and behold, just before we were ready to leave, we caught a great big fish. Didn't know what it was. Finally got it in, and it was about a 12-pound dogfish. <laughs> so, and of course, I don't know if you've ever seen a dogfish, but, I have. I but have. they have a spare set of lungs that they can breathe air yeah. and stay alive for a long time out of water. <laughs> we threw it in the back of my trunk, and uh, I was going to drop him off here at, uh, at uh, Schrader Hall, or I mean at um, Sergeant Hall, that was the residence quarters at the time. And uh, I said, well, what are we going to do with Oscar here in the, in, the, uh, in the trunk of my car? He said, I got the perfect idea. So we took it up to the third floor, plugged up all the drains in the shower. And there was about a six-inch lip. We filled that up with water and let it loose in there. Well, <laughs> during the night... Uh, apparently, uh, some of the uh, uh, coping along the side of it wasn't perfect and it started to leak and the people downstairs started to get water. And it, uh, there was a big ruckus as to who brought the fish into the shower. Well, I got, got up early the next morning. Jim Woods had called me up and uh, so we quickly wrapped it up in towels and brought it down to the lagoon. The lagoon is still there. Yeah, fish could be there too. Who knows? It probably is. So that, that fish went <laughs> from whatever lake to the shower and was breathing just fine and lived its life out in one of the ponds. Right. Wow, that's the best pond story I've heard, <laughs> heard in 21 years. That is great. And they well, never did find out that it was you and uh, the resident. No. That's good. When, Several of my fellow classmates loved to fish and hunt. Leo Murphy was another one that I'd go fishing with, and Kent Schaefer, yep. uh, Dale Fossum. We many times would go fishing, and Ed Wilkinson's, uh, his family had a cottage out in Tishigan. We'd go out there. Ed's down in, is he down in Florida, isn't he? And, yes, uh, at Gainesville. And we know that Kent's got a place on Lake Winnebago, so he's still catching walleyes. Yes, he is. And, uh, no, that's great. Uh, hey, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you, you've, you know, great stories about, you know, getting to medical school, going through medical school. Um, and you, you mentioned a little bit earlier your path after medical school. You mentioned starting your residency uh, in internal medicine in 1966. Hey, now, let's see, now, I... I I graduated in 64, so then I spent a year internship, that'd be 65. Right. That's what I was gonna ask, the, the year in between. Yeah, and that I took that at Lutheran Hospital. Okay. And then I went into the service for two years. Okay. That would have brought us up to 67. Right. And that, when I got out of the service is when I went into okay. internal medicine. Yeah, and that's I wanted to get the, the those those years that were missing in there. So you, you were in the service like many others. Yes. Where were you stationed? Very interesting story. That's why uh, we're here. <laughs> well, I was drafted into the Army, but in the meantime, I had a, sent in an application about a year earlier to the Public Health Service, which at that time they were accepting people into the public health service in lieu of military service. <clears throat> and then during the uh, Vietnam War, the Navy and Coast Guard had a close alliance with the public health service. And that's how I ended up in 
the public health service, and I was assigned to an Indian reservation in North Dakota, 10 miles from the Canadian border. Coldest place on earth. Yeah, North Dakota in the winter is not pleasant. But that's where I really learned how to goose hunt, duck hunt, upland hunting, and fishing through five feet of ice. Yes. <laughs> and, and no power augers back then. Oh, no. <laughs> Chop, chopping away. Well, that's neat. That's, so that, that kind of answers that question. You, you mentioned a little bit earlier your, your inter, in, internal medicine, but then with, a, you know, with an interest in infectious disease. And that's uh, where you ran into Dr. Rattel? Rattel, yes. Rattel, uh, here at, at the medical college. And yes. uh, had your interest, I mean, you were looking, you said you looked you know, nationwide and you, want, you wanted to find, and you found someone here. So you had an interest in an infectious disease before. I did. Yeah. I made a trip down to Chicago, uh, was interviewed there, and I made a trip to Detroit. But because of my large family, I didn't want to go too far. I uh, thought about Boston and et cetera, but uh, uh, Mike Rattel came at the right time. He was trained in uh, Northwestern, so got to meet a lot of interesting people through what, him. What you know, got you interested in infectious disease? Well, a lot of it had to do with my experience on the Indian Reservation. Um, the Indians, because of their culture, frequently ignored whatever illness they had until it was pretty far advanced. And uh, so I saw some horrendous infections uh, of the lung, uh, lost a, about a 10-year-old girl due to infection of her kidney. And we didn't have pathologists. I ended up doing the autopsy myself. We also didn't have anesthesiologists. I had to give any anesthesia to whoever uh, my partners were operating on and vice versa. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, I was the going into internal medicine, so they made me head of the ICU. Wow. It was a three-bed ICU. Jeez. <laughs> wow! How, how many uh, how many uh, Native Americans on the reservation? About ten thousand. Wow! And how many uh, docs? Five. Wow! And that's, we're all out of our internship. Wow! That's uh, some fast training. That uh, so it actually probably turned out pretty good for you. It did. We, we had uh, some backup from the Air Force Base in Minot, mm -hmm. and uh, we would take some of our more complicated cases who were able to be transported down there yeah. for their clinics. Wow. You know, the, um, so 1970, you finished your fellowship. Tell me, well, let's take a look at your career. Where did you jump to next and kind of take me through your your career? Through my association with Lutheran Hospital during my internship, I got to know a number of the uh, doctors who were in the Harwood Clinic. It was a clinic of internal medicine doctors. And uh, they asked me to join them. So I did, and uh, I told them I wanted to practice infectious diseases, but uh, there really wasn't much of a reason or a more, much of a need for it. In those days we only had three antibiotics mm -hmm. <laughs> so most internists felt competent to handle their own infections mm -hmm. but as time went on and a number of antibiotics increased exponentially uh, and the diseases became more complicated um, I think back in a number of diseases that were discovered after I got done with my uh, fellowship. Um, there, there was no Legionnaire's disease, there was no Lyme disease, there was no AIDS. Uh, those all came along after. And eventually I ended up doing just infectious disease and splitting away from Harwood. It was around uh, 1990. Uh, Tom Taft came with me. Yeah, and Tom was also an alumnus of the medical college. Right. 
And uh, he also 1980. Went, How's that for? I'm almost. I'm pretty sure he was 1980. That'd be about right. Yeah. yeah. So Tom joined me, and uh, where did you where did you both go from? So you had Harwood till about 1990. So for about 20 years at the Harwood Clinic, just down the street. And then where did you, is that, did you head to St. Joe's after that? By then I was on the staff of about eight different hospitals okay. in the metropolitan area. And uh, I was able to div divvy that up between Tom and I. And it turned out that the two hospitals I was busiest at was St. Joe's and Old Deaconess Hospital on uh, 19th and Wisconsin Avenue, mm -hmm. which eventually was bought out by Aurora and closed. Mm -hmm. I think they tore the building down I now. I don't think it's there anymore. So uh, I ended up then just focusing at St. Joe's. What was uh, the reason why you were all involved with eight different hospitals because there were not a great number of infectious disease specialists. That's, that's right. That's right. The only, when I got out, the only other person in practice, I should mention his name, is, is uh, Bert Wasprin. Bert was, he would go any place to see a infectious disease problem. But uh, he had some unusual ways of uh, dealing with antibiotics and made a few enemies along the way and at any event it was easy for me to get started once mm -hmm. I got out. The um, At at St. Joe's uh, I think when I first met you were involved with some administrative work there weren't you? I, I was uh, around that time I was uh, chairman of the Department of uh, Medicine and I also was teaching quite a bit the residency program there and by then I think it was 1993 or so, uh, the county started sending residents over to St. Joe's in order those are, to... Those are residents tied into the medical college because right. you've been a... Are you, are you still a clinical professor? Yes, I am. Yeah, and, and uh, so many years uh, teaching residents. I still give lectures. And uh, as I told you two weeks ago, or it was last week, when I interviewed Bill Listwan, he credits you with why he went into internal medicine. Bill had, Bill and I had a very special relationship and uh, he was a smart student. Yeah. That's neat that you're still, you know, involved like that. Uh, and you, you were just today at St. Joe's. Are you still have some uh, responsibilities at St. Joe's? I give two lectures a month. Okay. And I also uh, meet with the junior medical students uh, and they present some of their HMPs to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Lucky them. I mean, it's their, their good fortune to have you uh, as, a, as a teacher and a mentor. So three times a month I end up going that's, down. Oh, that's great. That. You know, during your career, obviously infectious disease probably has more, you know, you know opportunity for interesting stories. Any really, uh, you know, interesting dilemmas or stories that you ran across uh, during your career? I've seen some fascinating cases. I had uh, a nun who was the mother general of uh, one of the St. Francis sisters' uh, sex. They've got a couple of different sex, and she ended up with pneumonia that just wouldn't go away. We ended up doing a lung biopsy, and the organism that was causing the problem was Mycobacterium simiae which is a kissing cousin to Mycobacterium tuberculosis and had many of the same characteristics. Um, as it turned out, from her history, she spent at least 10 years in uh, rural communities in the jungles of uh, Africa. And that's probably where she picked it up. Uh, and she it took, took she, a while to incubate? She responded nicely to anti-tuberculous medication. Wow. Uh, and I had the guy who had a job for uh, uh, IBM uh, cash register company. Um, he, would, he would go down to the 
supermarkets and stores in South America and help them set up their stores, particularly the, uh, the cash registers. And he came back with a, uh, a lesion in his throat. Uh, I sent him to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. They did a biopsy. And he had South American blastomycosis, which is almost unheard of to make that diagnosis here in Milwaukee. So I never knew what I was going to run into. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would think that infectious disease it would be uh, so, sort of like the Forrest Gump opening a box of chocolates. You never know you what never you're going to get. You never know what you're going to get. never know what you're going to get. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. You know, the um, yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with you for over 20 years, uh, uh, first with your class of 19... 64 reunions, uh, and then uh, also on the Alumni Association Board of Directors and Executive Committee, and you've been involved in recent years on the Symposium for Senior Physicians uh, uh, Steering Committee, uh, as well as, you know, your years of uh, serving as a clinical professor. Uh, what has, uh, you know, it's kind of inspired you to stay as active as, as, as you have with uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin? I think my early influences was my mentors at uh, County Hospital, uh, Mike Rytel, Harry Rose, who was primarily at the VA, but would come over to the, uh, the County Hospital too. And uh, it, they influenced me and, and they kind of encouraged me to continue to uh, teach. Uh, the residents that I ran into uh, through the years, I really enjoyed and made friends with a lot of them and uh, students. So I think it was it was very uh, rewarding for me personally. Well, again, like I said, I, you've you know you've stretched your career many many years, and to still be teaching like you are, I said the the, the beneficiaries are those. Are those students, Jerry? You're, although you're one of those guys that I think you're a, definitely will be a lifelong learner, because I think it uh, that's I think maybe goes to your your detective work as an infectious disease expert. Still doing it. That's good. That's good. You know the uh, I did want to ask you. Um, you know, since it's interesting, you can give a good perspective on this because uh, graduated in '64, but still in 2016. Uh, 50 years later, you're, you know, you're, you're teaching students. What do you see as some of the, the, the differences in the, from your era in medical school and residency to today with you know, how the students are being taught? Let me show you one thing that has changed the whole face, and that's the iPhone. Right. I, I get very frustrated when I'm making rounds with them and I ask them a question. Before we're done, even discussing the case, they've got the answers of the questions that I've asked. So I got to a point where I said, by the way, I don't allow any iPhones uh, on rounds. Is that because they're, they're, they're punching in what you've asked? And oh, they're sure. coming up with some sort of a Google? They come up Google. with the answers. Google's pretty smart. It is. <laughs> I use it all the time, but not for medical, too many medical things. So. You think that the electronics and the, the ability with the computers. Big uh, difference. Uh, in my own education, I, I'm, I'm ordering uh, DVDs and sitting down and watching them and uh, watching online programs, taking my CMEs online instead of uh, the only way we used to get it was to go to meetings. Right. But I still go to meetings. And... Uh, that is, that's the biggest change I see. It's much faster yep. and less personal. Right. That, and that's, I, I hear that from, from everybody, but that's something that I, you know, you, you would expect. Uh, but the, uh, the other thing certainly is um, I think one of the reasons events like our symposium for senior physicians are, are fun is that uh, it's always struck me that compared to today when you began practicing, more of the community doctors all knew each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was true. And uh, when you get together for the CME here for the symposium, 
you see guys that you don't you don't see much anymore. So, well, that's great. Is there is there anything else you'd like to tell me about your career or your time at uh, Marquette or any anything in between? Well, some of the greatest people I didn't mention that I met here was uh, Walt Hogan, uh, Jim Sirletti, uh, Mike Keelan. They all became very good friends with me and uh, taught me a lot. Jim Botticelli, who has passed, uh, was a great teacher. Um, Gordon Schneider, who was here for a while, Harry Rose, uh, Eugene Stead. They were all great teachers. Yeah. So. Well, they passed on that seed to you, and now you're a, <laughs> continue to be a great teacher. I'd like to try. Yeah. Well, Jerry, thanks a lot for, for joining me today. Thank you. You bet. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking me. Mm -hmm.